Today, I'm going to be reviewing the 2018 Maserati Ghibli SQ4. That is the more powerful version of the Ghibli with the all-wheel drive. I have a 2018 model here, but I'm going to talk to you a lot about some of the changes, little changes that went on for 2019 that Maserati has improved here. I'm going to talk to you about the interior. We're going to go for a drive, and then I'm going to give you my verdict uh, and give you my car buzz ranking of where I think the Ghibli sits and if you should ultimately buy one. And if you want the best deals on a Maserati Ghibli, be sure to click up here or check the link in the description for the best deals on the Maserati Ghibli. And of course, the two things that matter most on a Maserati is how it looks. Pretty darn gorgeous. I don't know what they did with the facelift. I never thought the Ghibli was that attractive of a car, but they did this minor facelift to it makes it look a lot prettier, at least in the front. I'll talk about the back. But then the second most important thing is how it drives. So let's get behind the wheel and see how the Ghibli fares. All right, so now I'm behind the wheel of the Ghibli. So I'm gonna talk a lot about how it drives because this is a very important aspect to buying a Maserati. It's one of the main reasons why you'd want to choose one over a similarly priced German or even a Japanese luxury car because Italian cars are supposed to drive beautifully. So does the Ghibli drive beautifully? That is the question. So when the Ghibli first came out, it had a hydraulic steering rack. Now I never drove a Ghibli with the hydraulic steering, but this one has an all new electric rack, which Maserati said it implemented so that it could have more safety features like lane keep assist, all those sort of things, the sort of self steering, self driving functionalities. And I don't know how much was really lost from that transition. Most automakers are really transitioning now to electric steering, even Porsche. But this steering, it's not my favorite. I, I just came out of driving the Levante last week and I kind of felt that it had a little bit more joy to it than the way the Ghibli drives. I'm not sure what it is. It's sort of loose on center. It feels a little bit heavier when you load up the steering. And then it kind of just feels like it has different weights depending on how much steering effort you're giving. It's kind of weird, not too bad. I actually do like it. It is pretty fun to drive on a back road, although it doesn't inspire that much confidence. Uh, it's definitely not the best uh, steering that I've driven, although it's pretty good. So I won't really fault it too much on that. One thing I will fault it on is we have the Grand Lusso trim and I'm sure you can change this if you fiddle around with Maserati's sort of endless array of options, but I have this steering wheel with this sort of black piano trim around the entire uh, circumference of it. It's not comfortable, or at least to my hands, the steering wheel itself is very thick and the outer layer just has this sort of wood trim on the outside. I really don't like the way it feels in my hand. It's very uncomfortable, um, so I would definitely rather have a full leather steering wheel, maybe one with perforated, sort of like the one I had on the Levante that I drove last week. So let's talk about the engines because there's really only one engine option you can get in the Ghibli because of course in America we don't get the diesel engine, which is fine. I don't think too many people would buy that anyway. The base engine is a three liter twin turbocharged V6 producing 345 horsepower. Not bad, but like that's sort of what like Audi A6, BMW, 540i's produce really not that special although it does sound a lot better than those German cars we have the Ghibli S uh, Q4 actually so there's two trims you can get you can get a regular Ghibli S which is of course going to be rear wheel drive or you can get the Ghibli S Q4 which is what we have here which is all wheel drive both have a 3 liter V6 producing 424 horsepower a lot more you're going to get 0 to 60 in 4.9 seconds with rear wheel drive 4.7 a little little bit quicker with all-wheel drive both send power out through an eight-speed automatic now I've been driving around in increased control and efficiency mode that's basically like an eco mode makes it really quiet really stealthy then I'm gonna go ahead and put it in sport mode as you can hear maybe on the audio the exhaust gets a lot louder when I do that definitely is very much of a difference from behind the cabin at least at idle that is um, and I'm gonna go ahead and put it in its manual mode by pushing this little M button here here. And for me to take manual control, I have to do it here on the stick because we have a Grand Lusso, not a Grand Sport. I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between those later. 
there are no paddle shifters on the wheel. You can option them back, but this particular model does not have it. So here we go. I'm gonna do a nice acceleration run here. It's very, very quick. Sounds pretty good while you're doing it too. The brakes are mighty. They're Brembo units. You just sort of slam on them. Ooh, yes, they work really, really good. Let's go ahead and take it out of manual mode. You get the nice aggressive pops when you shift in sport mode. It sounds pretty good. Transmission does a pretty good job of shifting quickly. It's a ZF transmission, although it's not the best state of tune that I've driven at least. I've driven some that are a little snappier on those gear changes. And although that sound is really, really nice, not quite as nice as what I remember from the Levante, which was actually a regular, not an S model. So a bit surprising that Maserati didn't really make this as loud. It's loud on the outside, but because we have these double thick windows and just a really quiet cabin, you don't get to hear that amazing exhaust as much as you might expect. And another difference on this Grand Lusso trim versus the Grand Sport is that we don't have Maserati's Skyhook adaptive air suspension. And I found the Levante to be very, very comfortable. It did bounce around quite a little bit, but it wasn't too bad. It actually rode pretty nice over bumps at high speed. The Ghibli is a fair bit stiffer. If you're looking for a luxury car that's just gonna quietly and smoothly get you over the bumps, this is not it. It's a little bit stiff for my liking, although it's really not too bad. You can option that adaptive Skyhook technology, so I'd like to maybe drive one that has that to see if that really makes a big difference. Um, but yeah, this is not the most luxurious experience. It is pretty quiet though. The double pane glass and all that really does take care of all the wind noise, so that's pretty nice. Um, and then you really have to decide whether or not the Grand Lusso or the Grand Sport is the one for you. Obviously, there's a little bit of a difference in what they come with as far as options. They do look a little bit different on the outside. You do get a different interior. I happen to really like the interior on this Grand Lusso, as I'm gonna talk about. But yeah, the, the Ghibli just falls into this sort of weird spot in the market. It's not the the sportiest driving. There are faster cars for this price category. They, they raised the horsepower. I think this car only had about 400 horsepower, so the 424 number is actually a little bit of a bump. But when you're talking, this car starts at 82,000. The one that I have here is about 92,000. There are a lot of cars in that price category that you can get that offer a similar, if not a better level of performance and possibly a better interior as well. Cars like the BMW M550i, cars like the Audi S6 and S7, those are really nice cars and you have to really want the special added nicety of driving a Maserati because I'll admit, while Audis and BMWs are nice, they don't carry the same brand cachet as Maserati. So that's just something you really have to think about before you buy this car because the driving experience, I feel like, isn't as differentiated as it was in the Levante. I cannot think of that many other SUVs at that price level that sound that good and drive that good. But in this sedan segment, there are quite a few actually. Coming into the interior, I'm gonna talk more about sort of what I like to call the mixed Maserati bag of goodies in here. Some of the interior is extremely nice. Other parts of it, let's just say not so nice. So let's start off with this 8.4 inch touchscreen. It's called Maserati Touch Control, which is Italian for Chrysler Uconnect. Because if you've rented a Dodge Dart or a Chrysler 200, you've probably seen this exact same thing before. It's an 8.4 inch touchscreen. You'll notice it on all other FCA products, except Alfa Romeo, interestingly enough. It's actually really good. I'm sort of glad that Maserati just decided to borrow this from Fiat and Chrysler. It's actually a lot easier to use than Alfa Romeo's technology. Touchscreen is great. Everything is really, really usable. I do wish there were a little bit more climate controls down here, especially for the heated and ventilated seats. Uh, to control those, you have to either go into climate. There we go. I can put my ventilated seat on here. They come out of this nice cloth, which is awesome on this Grand Lusso trim. 
Um, so yeah, I really like that. I wish there was a little more controls for it here. Some of the things I wish were easier to get to, for example, the start, stop, off, defeat. Uh, I could not use that m more frequently, so I wish it was just a button somewhere near the starter instead of being on the screen. I really didn't like this car when it goes into start, stop. Uh, it's loud, it's clunky, and just not something I really want on a sporty car like this. You can control all of your uh, safety features here. We have our lane keep assist. I kept that off as well. I found it to be really aggressive. It would kind of yank the steering wheel out of my hands every once in a while. Blind spot I left on, but only in visual mode. I got real annoyed as I would signal and it would go beep, beep, beep every time somebody was in my blind spot. I just wanted it to flash. Forward collision, I left that on too. I didn't find it to be too overly crazy. The traffic sign assist, that's going to come on this uh, Grand Lusso trim. You can get it on the Grand Sport as well as part of the driver assistance package that is uh, gonna give you these readouts of the speed limit on your center screen here pretty nice pretty easy feature to always know uh, what speed limits are not bad surround view camera gonna give you a nice view around you can sort of change the angles on here it's not the best resolution ever I've driven a couple of BMWs and Mercedes recently that really blow this camera out of the water but I do like that it's there so I'm not going to complain too much one interesting thing that you can get on this Maserati screen is a user guide so I'm going to go ahead and click that it takes a little quick second to load since I had it loaded up before it loaded up pretty quickly and this is even though there is a user manual in the glove box it's going to give you sort of like a digital uh, look onto things so you can click explore you can click you know this part the back seats and you can sort of click on individual parts of the menu so front ventilated seats let's hear about what those about are about to enhance occupants comfort by high external temperatures both the driver and passenger seats on request can be ventilated small fans are located in the seat cushion and seat back they draw air I just find it really funny that Maserati went through and gave a description of how ventilated seats work and there, there's just a lot of these on here front heated seats I can get the same thing it's kind of cool uh, kind of unnecessary like I don't think there are gonna be too many people that just want to read about how the heated seats work but whatever it's, a, it's just a nice little cool thing that they put in here we also have voice command here it's really easy it tells you what you can and can't say Canceled. I found it to work extremely well Let's talk about some of the things that I don't like as much because this screen, very, very good, even though it is a borrowed Chrysler component. What I hate is this shifter. I won't harp on it too long like I didn't in the Levante video, but getting it into reverse, I was able to do it that time, but I compel you to get in the car, start it, and just kind of go through it quickly and hit reverse. You miss it all the time. Really annoying, but Maserati has had a number of complaints about this shifter and will change it to a different style one in 2019. Uh, to the left of the shifter, we have some of our drive mode controls. We have traction control off. We have M, which is going to put it in the manual mode. Interestingly, because we have a Grand Lusso, not a Grand Sport, no paddle shifters on this one, so you've got to do it on the stick. I actually did miss the paddles. They are really large. They're column mounted and they're metal. So the disadvantages to them is they're a little bulky and big, so you can't get to the turn signal stock as easily, nor can you get to the radio control buttons on the back as easily, but I did miss them and I did wish that I had them in this car. You can option them back. I believe it's $500 on this Grand Lusso trim. You've got ICE, which stands for Increased Control and Efficiency. I talked about that a little bit on our drive. Basically just shuts the car up, makes it uh, more of an eco mode. And then you've got Sport Mode, opens up those baffles, makes it sound pretty darn good. Although this cabin is so dang quiet, didn't really get to hear the exhaust too much. One interesting layout option of the Ghibli over the Levante is you have this little storage area here with your USB SD card slot. You have this little slide out tray. You can stick your phone there. I actually really liked that. I just kind of stuck my phone there, plugged it in and used uh, Android Auto. This car also has Apple CarPlay. Big complaint here is that if you have any 
any sort of drink, I compel you to fit it into this cup holder. This might be the single worst cup holder that I've had in any of my review cars. There's no grips, so if you do have something small enough to fit in there, it will just kind of flop around. There's nothing to sort of hold it in steady, and it is so small that even the smallest, thinnest water bottle that I use on a daily basis does not fit in there. It's kind of ridiculous that this is a practical four-door sedan and it has cup holders that just don't fit anything. There are two additional ones in the uh, center armrest and then two more in the back seat, but they are also equally tiny. Clearly, this was meant for smaller European people who have much smaller drinks than us because in America, this does not classify as a cup holder, at least not for me. We also have this little area here. It's just a nice little storage bin. I've been keeping my garage door opener in there this whole time. And then as with the Levante, I have this little rotating knob here. You just kind of spin it. This is for volume up here on the top. The bottom part is just to rotate around the menus. Don't really get the purpose of it. It didn't use it at all this entire time. It is a touch screen. I would rather just do that. We do have these nice blue analog gauges. I'm actually a big fan of the digital gauges that a lot of automakers are switching to, Audi, BMW, uh, even Mercedes now has digital gauges, just one big screen up there instead of physical gauges. But when they look this beautiful with this nice blue background and these really cool stylized needles, I don't mind having the old school physical gauges. I think they look really nice. Uh, the steering wheel, not my favorite. I actually preferred the one in the Levante that I had, which was a Grand Sport. That's because on the side here, I'll show you that in uh, in another clip, is that it has sort of this black wood going around the whole edge of it, and it just feels really uncomfortable in my hands. It's a little thick. I wish it was a little thinner, and I hate having this around the edge. I wish it was just all leather. And then one little defect that I have here is on the back of the steering wheel, the stitching is like kind of sharp here. So I've poked my finger on it. It actually kind of hurts just a little bit. So I'm sure not all Ghiblis have that, but this particular one has a little uh, stitching defect on that side. And over here to the left of the steering wheel we have something that some people might criticize Maserati for is that they've used all of the starter button the switches the window switches all of that for the lights and stuff from Chrysler products so these are pretty much identical to what you'd get in a Dodge Charger or a Chrysler Pacifica I don't think too many Maserati owners are ever gonna travel in the same circles as people uh, who drive those vehicles but perhaps maybe you're in your Ghibli traveling and you have to rent a Dodge Charger or something and you'll notice the same same switches. Not a good day for the Maserati driver when they notice that the switches are the exact same. I personally don't care. They're just window switches. Not really a big deal to me, but it may matter to you. And since this is a four-door sedan, I'm sure a lot of you are going to want to know how practical it is back here. Now I have the front seat moved up for filming purposes, but even with the seat in my normal driving position, I do have a pretty adequate amount of legroom back here. The two seats are actually pretty comfortable, although the middle seat is going to be pretty difficult. That's pretty much standard on a lot of sedans nowadays. Uh, we have the Grand Lusso trim, which is more of like the luxury level trim. And interestingly you get cloth interior so you have this red leather on this one and then this black cloth insert I love it I wish that more luxury cars offered cloth seats cloth is actually a really nice material it breathes better this one has heated and ventilated seats so it actually ventilates through the cloth part feels amazing actually I think the seats are pretty comfortable although I wish there was a little bit more lumbar support adjustment and I have had one or two passengers complain that the the passenger seat they couldn't get the lumbar to kind of go away they put it all the way back but they still felt like there was lumbar back there so yeah that's a little bit of an oddity um, so yeah back seats pretty good headroom it's sort of carved out that it's low here and then it gets higher up right where you put your head so there's actually quite a decent amount of headroom back here as I just noticed these floor mats don't really stick in properly over here, we have this very, very basic armrest. It's leather wrapped in some parts. So right here, we have some storage area. And then we have one of the cheapest parts of this entire car, these cup holders. You can kind of hear it. Like It's really cheap plastic. You can't really get a great 
cup to fit in there. It's really small, sort of like the ones in the front. Yeah, this is just uh, like not really Maserati quality. I'm kind of surprised that they cheaped out so much on this armrest. It's really hard to get it to close. And it's red plastic, which just kind of looks janky and cheap. So yeah, not really too impressed with that. And then there's really nothing back here in terms of luxury. There's no heated seats back here, although you can option them. We do have two climate controls here, but no USB, no outlets, no nothing for you to charge up your phone. So just a pretty basic uh, four-door sedan experience here. Coming to the back of the Ghibli, I get to show you uh, the trunk space, which means I get to use the heaviest key fob in the world. I mean, seriously, this thing is metal, really nice, really big, chunky. If I just give it a double push here, I get to open the automatic trunk here, revealing uh, a little over 17 cubic feet of storage space. Not bad whatsoever. You can see I have all of my camera equipment in there, swallows it right up, and the seats do fold flat, although it's not the best opening back there. Uh, to shut it, you do have to come to the trunk, you have this nice little button. You can go ahead and shut it electronically. It goes really, really silently. I really like that. Styling on the Ghibli, when it first came out, I really didn't like this car. And I mentioned up front how I really like the subtle facelift that they did to the front end of the Ghibli. The rear kind of still looks like it did back in 2014. And I've never been able to unsee this. I was in a parking lot and I thought I saw a Ghibli when it first came out. And I was like, oh, interesting. Let me go up and see it. And when I got up to the car, it was not a Maserati Ghibli. It was a Kia Cadenza. I think that this car and the Kia Cadenza look almost identical. If you look at the tail lights of this car and the Kia, they look almost identical. I'm not sure which one came out first, but that's either a really big compliment to Kia or a really mean insult to Maserati. I'll let you decide which, but the rear end, definitely not my favorite. The front end, a lot better on this 2018 model. And another reason why you'll want to buy a Maserati over an Audi or a BMW or a Mercedes, even the AMG and M1s, is the way it sounds. This engine is really, really nice sounding. Even though it's a V6, this is one of the best sounding V6s on the market. And Maserati actually started from an unlikely source. The block of this engine is taken from one of Chrysler's Pentastar units, interestingly enough. So you might think that's a little bit of a humble origin for such a special engine, but wait until you hear it. You won't be thinking, yeah, it's pretty loud, especially when you put it in sport mode and the baffles open and you rev it up. It sounds pretty spectacular. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a Chrysler engine. So I know that just the block is from Chrysler, but Ferrari really did tune and fettle and design most of what this makes this engine tick, which is why it sounds so spectacular. So let's finish off with some pricing on our 2018 Maserati Ghibli. I'm gonna give you 2019 prices because the 19s are already starting to show up in showrooms. So a base Ghibli is gonna start just under $75,000 with that base three liter V6 uh, with rear wheel drive only, no all wheel drive available on that base model, 345 horsepower, or you can step it up to the Ghibli S. That's gonna give you 424 horsepower going out to rear wheel drive. Uh, this model model here is the Ghibli SQ4, which adds all-wheel drive, comes in handy in places like Florida where I live where it rains all the time, or if you live in a snowy climate and want to use this as your daily driver. Now on top of the Ghibli SQ4, uh, which is $82,480, you can select either the Grand Lusso or Grand Sport trim. They both cost exactly the same, oddly enough, $87,000 uh, delivered, just under $88,000. And the Grand Lusso, which is what we have here is more of the luxury trim one. So you're gonna get the chrome front fascia, you're gonna get the leather interior with the partial cloth, heated and ventilated front seats, black leather and a wood steering wheel, which I don't like, I'd rather have the full leather. The adaptive LED headlights with high beam assist, the 10 speaker Harman Kardon premium audio system, which is above the base one, you can also opt for a Bowers and Wilkins. Haven't had a chance to sample that, but I've heard it's pretty good. And then you get the painted red brake calipers with the white Maserati 
Maserati script. If you go for the Grand Sport, you get a lot of those same options, but a little bit different as well. You get a different front fascia, you get different wheels, um, you'll get the Skyhook performance uh, suspension, the air suspension, you'll get 12-way power front sport seats, a different steering wheel with column-mounted paddle shifters, and then you'll get those LED headlights and the Harman Kardon premium audio as well. We do have some options on this car, bringing the total price up to a little over $92,000. We have the driver's assistance package, which in 2018 cost $2,800, but Maserati has actually lowered it. It's only $1,500 now for 2019. Not a bad uh, way to go. I actually think it is worth optioning. You do get your adaptive cruise control, that 360 degree camera, the traffic sign recognition, the highway assist steering, and frontal collision avoidance. The only one of those bunch that I didn't like as much was the highway assistance, where it would sort of steer you back into your lane. Um, I like those systems when you kind of notice them working in the background. This one was kind of aggressive. So that's the only thing I really didn't like too much about it. So as optioned, our car is just over $92,000. Not a cheap date by any stretch. We are touching almost $100,000 here. Interestingly, Maserati has added a few V8 options on the Levante SUV, but not on this Ghibli. There's no V8 Ferrari engine option on this, only those V6s. And in this segment, in the sedan segment, I think that the Maserati Maserati is just not as differentiated as the Levante. I can't count that many SUVs that gave me that same tingle, that same fizz that the Levante did, but there are a lot of sedans in this segment that do give me that level of excitement, which is why the Maserati Ghibli is a lot harder to recommend than the Levante. It receives a rating of worth a look. It's very pretty. I think a lot of people love the styling. It has a pretty nice interior, even though there's some faults there. The technology is far more advanced than it used to be. This used to be a very basic car with not a lot of high-tech features, but Maserati's come a long way in that respect, although not on the same level as BMW or Audi as far as the self-driving features are concerned. So yeah, this is a very interesting car. It does sound really good, it does look really good, and it does give you that exotic ownership feel, which some people might not like because obviously this is a little bit more of an expensive car to own every day. I noticed a couple issues on this one, brake squeal being one of them, a little bit of issues on the interior. So you may have some ownership experiences with this car down the line, but still definitely worth a look in this highly competitive sports sedan segment. And if you like this review and you'd like to see more, be sure to subscribe to the Car Buzz YouTube channel and be sure to download our app on iOS and Android. I'm Jared Rosenholtz. Hope you've enjoyed the video.